This is Dr. Adam Rindy, the host of the One Thing Podcast, and welcome to our next episode on mitochondria and health. Mitochondria lie at the center of life. At conception, we inherit our mother's mitochondrial DNA, and our electricity for life is turned on. The mitochondrial journey is much like our life's journey. In fact, as we age, the mitochondrial volume and output may start to decline, and then we may start to experience the effects of aging. In this episode, my guest, Dr. Chris Miletus, the author of the book, Mito Longevity, speaks with us deeply about the role of mitochondria in health. We discussed mitochondrial role in the immune system, inflammation, hormonal health, and mental health. We discuss evaluation for mitochondrial decline, nutrition, and lifestyle factors, and so much more. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. It's a ton of information. Strap in and get ready to learn. Dr. Miletus, thank you for joining me today to speak about mitochondria. Hey, well, thanks for having me. It's a topic I just love and love to share about it. Great. Well, how did you get interested in mitochondria? Like, I know you've lectured and written on many topics in your long career. Um, what brought you into thinking about mitochondria? Uh, great question. I think for both of us, you know, as naturopathic physicians, we're taught to really just think of the bigger picture and not just a disease, but the processes that cause aging and poor aging, good aging. And I like to always ponder the magnificent way the human body is made. So often we forget to look at the things which, of course, we can't see with our eyes, like the mitochondria. We think, well, liver, eyes, you know, heart. But after all, what do they all have in common? Well, they have what I call the Energizer Bunny battery. That is the mitochondria, because without the mitochondria, there's no ATP production. And adenosyl triphosphate is the currency which allows us to have every single cell in our body work and all of our genetic potential be what it can be. And if we're underfueled, much like a off-brand um, battery or an underfueled battery, we're not going to work. And I give the example of a cell phone. And if you think, or now what we call them smartphones, but a cell phone, of course, is just a glorified paperweight if it doesn't have a charge. You know, it's a thousand dollar paperweight. Well, likewise, the trillions of cells in our body, if they don't have an adequate charge, that is ATP energy, they're not going to be able to serve their DNA production or capacity. So a uh, cell phone has an app. Consider that the software, the DNA, and our cells have DNA. So I make a direct comparison for my patients of an app, DNA, cell phone battery, human cellular energy, and mitochondria. Great. Well, that is a perfect place to start. So if we were to like back out and think about the mitochondria from a big picture standpoint, and for some people who maybe have not thought about mitochondria since high school biology. Let's just give a basic description, if you would, about the mitochondria, where they live, what they do, how they came to be. Well, wonderful. So the mitochondria live within each of our cells. And our cells, of course, have the regular DNA, which is half mom, half dad. And then there's the mitochondrial DNA. And the mitochondrial DNA is actually 99 plus plus percent only from the mother's lineage. And it's actually goes ahead and goes from mom to grandma. So when I do a intake for a patient, of course, I ask, how's your mother's history? How's your father's history? But I really want to know how energetic is your mother's lineage? So the women in the family, your grandmother, your great grandmother, were they peppy, zippy doodahs, or were they kind of sluggish and sloth like? Because that will tell you how your mitochondrial potential is. And then, of course, what you and I and all of us do, male and female, um, will determine, of course, how well we nourish those mitochondria. So we have our what we call our nuclear DNA. That's half mom, half dad. Then we have our mitochondrial DNA, which they actually have done the research and they have tracked it back to what they call mitochondrial Eve. And I think they've tracked it back to five or seven original women. Of course, it had to be, of course, the, the original woman somewhere along the way. And so it's like they can actually track the DNA all the way back. And, of course, that's the wonderful beauty of this is the commonality of humanity. You know, we have so much more in common than we have different. Mm -hmm. 
And so they're basically an, an organelle, correct? Yes, uh, an organelle, um, which, of course, is just these, and there's, of course, ribosomes and other aspects of an organelle. But the concept here is there's an what we call oxidation, phosphorylation, and many big old fancy what I call alphabet soup words, which the biochemists and biologists and microbiologists have came up with. But I like to keep it in the broader, bigger sense of it, they have to themselves have an innate ability to generate energy, which, interesting, diminishes with time. So when we were 30 years old, and I'm 54, I was making about 143 pounds, that's 65 kilos for our European and Canadian and people north of the border and south of the border, and of course around the world. So 65 kilos, 143 pounds at the age of 30. But for every decade after 30, we lose 10% of our mitochondrial function. And that is our inner energy dynamo blast furnace, whatever we want to call it, which actually allows our body to function and you know, thrive and not just survive. Okay. So obviously this is very important in understanding aging and disease. And I want to also frame this, that we're not today talking about um, genetic mitochondrial disorders that people are born with. This is a whole different topic. And what we're talking about is functional mitochondrial issues that come with living over time. And with that in mind, let's talk about how mitochondria are involved with inflammation and aging specifically. You speak about in your book, this concept of mitotricity, which you've alluded to um, earlier in our talk today. Maybe we can go into these different interwoven concepts of inflammation, aging, and mitotricity. Oh, beautiful. I, I actually coined the term mitotricity because it is our currency that allows our cells to function. And to think of the human body, if we have 100 billion neurons in our brain, and of course we have what we call neuroplasticity, the ability to heal our brain, because we lose about 86,400 brain cells a day. Then we have a heart, which if you, I, and our audience had an average pulse, of 72 beats per minute. That means our heart will have beaten by the end of 24 hours, 103,680 times through 60,000 miles of blood vessels, all of which have to have the mitotricity in order to function. And I give the example for my patients of if I take a pen with a click, 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 you know, open, close, open, close, I, I can guarantee you after 103,680 times, my thumb will quit and not show up tomorrow to, for the job. Yet my our heart, our cardiomyocytes keep on coming every day, hopefully with no interruptions for, you know, seven decades, eight decades, hopefully longer. But the reality is the mitochondria are critical for immune function. In fact, there's some beautiful articles. And actually, I gave a lecture uh, for usbiotech.com. Uh, where I'm an educational consultant, about how the mitochondria is involved in immune, in immune function and inflammation. We used to, and I, as we started the conversation today, the mitochondria energy. Well, of course, our natural killer cells, which I call the Green Beret, Army Rangers, Navy Seals of our immune system, well, they, of course, have to have mitochondrial energy as well. But beyond that, the research now shows that the mitochondria is so much more than just energy it also controls inflammation and even our viral competence, our ability to deal with viruses and illnesses and whatnot in a very direct way. And then the, for those in the audience which like to geek out on technology and terminology, there's something called PARPs and sirtuins. And sirtuins are a chemical system, enzymatic chemical system within our body, which are critical for not only healthy aging, and some people that are into intermittent fasting know the word sirtuins because it's actually the sirtuins, which are augmented and improved when, when we do intermittent fasting, which for those that aren't familiar in the audience, imagine going fasting for 18 hours and then only eating six hours a day in one single block. Some go as far as 20 hours fasting, four of hours of eating, of course, which is an extreme version, but that helps sirtuins and slows down, quote unquote, the aging process all things being equal and susceptible people that have that ability to kick in the sirtuins. 
Then the PARPs, P-A-R-P-S, for example, the research now on COVID shows that PARPs 9, 10, 11, and 12 are actually kicked in to help fight off the immune capacity of the virus. So we have mitochondria for energy. We have mitochondria for inflammation control. And we have it also for viral immune competence. And in my expectation over the last 28 years, and that's just going to be the tip of the iceberg as we learn more and more as human beings, we realize, oh my goodness, we didn't know it did that as well. And so it's very compelling to look at whenever we're looking at a body system. And as you said, there's something called mitochondriopathies and people are born with these mitochondriopathies or genetic susceptibilities where there's, of course, inherent potential weakness. And we want to, of course, support them as well. And I have a couple of those patients in my practice. And then we have what I will term earned mitochondriopathies. Certain medications can induce mitochondriopathies or mitochondrial dysfunction. And so we can chat about that today as well. So it's all about tending not only to our heart. So we do things nutritionally and exercise and sleep and whatnot and take care of our heart. Likewise, we can take an herb for our liver. But remember, the common denominator between all of these is, once again, the mitochondria. And whether it be something like MitoQ or NAD from Truniagen, these are nutrients, for example, that I use in my clinical practice to support the mitochondria. Because when we were not even a glimmer in mother's and father's eye, of course, we were an oocyte, an unfertilized egg within mom, within inside of grandma. And so knowing grandma's history and knowing mom's history as to what they all got exposed to, and imagine grandma was from rural Kansas or Nebraska or Iowa. And in the 1930s, she actually would go out with the crop duster spraying DDT because as the story goes, as I've heard from my patients, it was a cool mist on a hot summer day. They weren't even thinking about DDT, which was of course bad in 1972. But grandma had it, and if she was pregnant with mom, mom was getting indoctrinated and exposed to this. And likewise, we are passed through. Now they know there's some 200 plus known cancer-causing chemicals in cord blood per the environmental working group. So we, we don't live in Little House in the Prairie days anymore. Or one of my other books I wrote called The Disciples Diet, I talk about how do people eat 2,000 years ago? Very Mediterranean-ish. But the water was pure, unless there was cattle upstream. But the, there was in the industrial exposures. There weren't the phthalates and parabens and styrenes. There weren't all these man-made, human-made chemicals. And the air is fresher. Foods by nature were organic. We didn't have better living through chemistry. So we have to now fend and tend to our gardens, our trees and cells that make up our bodies, more than ever before in human history. So it's a scary time in a time in which we just have to be very aware that it's going to be proactiveness that actually helps us prevent what I call reactiveness. And reactiveness is when we, have, when we haven't been able to take care of our bodies or something comes along and we end up on a gurney in a hospital say, am I next? Whereas proactive is trying to avoid that with all our vim and vigor. Mm-hmm. So what would be some of the conditions or symptoms of someone who's seeing decline in mitochondria that, you know, sort of beyond the obvious? Yeah. So, of course, we have the aging process. And so the aging process itself, of course, will cause diminished mitochondria. And so often people will say, well, I'm just getting old. That's just how it is once you hit 40, 50, 60, 70. But I think we all have examples of people in our lives that boy, if we only had the zippity doo dah that they have, and they're decades older than us. Then we see people younger than us, and they're tired, they're worn out. They just can't, maybe they have exercise intolerance. Maybe they have chronic fatigue. And of course, there's many reasons to be chronically fatigued. So it's not just mitochondria, but the mitochondria, if not fully nourished, will of course be one of the variables. And you and I in our practices, of course, know we're under variable control. We try to control as very as many variables as possible for our patients. Hydration, eating, bowel habits, probiotics. And so the goal is the mitochondria is, since it's a common denominator amongst all the cells in our body, it's the thing which we have to always look at as a foundational thing. As much as we have water and food and breathing adequately, making sure we're oxygenated, including at night to avoid sleep apnea, 
we want to make sure that our mitochondria are dialed in. But when I work with a patient with, let's say, GI issues, let's say they have leaky gut syndrome, well, we know that the tight junctions of the colonocytes and enterocytes, the little cells lining our GI tract, have to be properly fueled. And a lecture I gave about five or six years ago down at the big international conference um, called A4M, um, anti-aging conference, was called the m M&M lecture. and had nothing to do with the candy or the wrapper. It had to do with the microbiome and mitochondria. And you and I, of course, work with this with our patients all the time, that when we fuel the GI tract properly, then the short-chain fatty acids, including butyrate, will actually then, in turn, cross over the enterocytes, colonocytes, and actually fuel them at the mitochondrial level. Whereas if you have a low butyrate level, once again, all things we need, well, lots of different genetic susceptibilities and lifestyle susceptibilities, low butyric acid or butyrate made hopefully by your GI tract will actually help confer a degree of protection against things like colon cancer, col- colitis and so forth. So it's really looking at r- any body system and even very odd and genetic conditions like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or retinitis pigmatosa. Um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, as it sounds, is a muscular dystrophy, which will potentially impact a person's life very early on, and they end up on steroids and drugs and so forth. But if you look at the mechanisms, there's nitric oxide, there's mitochondrial issues, there's NAD issues. Likewise, with retinitis pigmatosa, it's a condition which, of course, happens as one ages, whereas genetic predestination, once again, all things been equal because we always have the ability to intervene, and it leads to blindness. And it's just like a ticking time bomb, like so many genetic conditions. But if you look at the common denominators, once again, often the mitochondria is part of that picture. Not that we're saying we can cure these things, but if we can slow it down or minimize the outcome, and the difference being that when we fuel our bodies, and you and I, I'm sure, chat the same with, with our patients, if we fed our bodies fast food our whole life versus pristine organic foods, once again, input equals output. And you and I were born 6, 8, 10, 12 pounds, however heavy we were. Now we weigh more than that. Well, what are we made of? Our food. So I like to always show my patients a cartoon of the picture of a person made of hot dogs and burgers and soda pops and literally making up the cells. That's the infrastructure. That's the rebar or pristine vegetables and phytonutrients and all these wonderful lush nutrients that actually they built their bodies strong. But since our Mm -hmm. bodies are always replenishing the cells, it's never too late to take on a healthy diet, lifestyle, exercise, and always rule out sleep apnea as well. So many people think they don't have sleep apnea, but if you think about any tissue in your body, or if you've ever had your blood pressure taken, which I think we've all experienced, and if they pump up the cuff too much, it starts hurting. Or if you ever put a rubber band around your finger, it starts hurting. That's called hypoxia. And millions of people have hypoxia, and that impacts the mitochondria as well. Because if you're under breathing, much like if your automobile is, it's going to cause lack of performance. And so we want to stay around 98% oxygen throughout the day and night. But people are dropping much lower into 80s, 70s, 60s. And they don't even know it because they say, well, I don't snore. I don't have this symptom or that symptom. But once again, it's a slow but sure death of our cells and it causes ultimately cellular dysfunction and once again, premature aging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I open up uh, the literature and I'm searching for underlying cause of any particular common Western disease, it's undoubtedly going to pull up articles and research related to mitochondrial connections, so such things as type 2 diabetes and cancer and dementia, Alzheimer's. So, and you go into this in your book that you just recently released, um, and uh, it's well documented. So, you know, as a naturopathic physician, when, you know, what part of our premise is to treat the cause, it seems undoubtedly that when we are going through a process with a patient trying, trying to help them feel better, that addressing the mitochondria is, is eventually a road that we'll need to cross. Yeah, and I think for sure. And of course, the older you are or the more medications you've taken, um, one of our colleagues, Dr. Neuschfeld, um, he actually has written an article that was published in 2008 
in the peer review literature PubMed that actually list the whole litany of drugs that actually can poison the mitochondria. And once again, when I say the whole list, but it's a big list. Things like metformin, of course, the statin drugs, propofol, which both Michael Jackson and Joan Rivers were reportedly had in their system before they passed away. And if you think about ultimately the mitochondria are waxing and waiting and fading, um, it's basically like snuffing out a candle. It's basically you're basically slowly but surely taking the last little gasp, and then you hit that threshold of the straw that broke the camel's back. You're just underfueled enough, much like on our cell phones, because I make that, once again, that comparison, cell phone, human cell. If you're down to 5%, certain apps won't work, or they won't work as well, or you're going to have internet or connectivity lagging. Well, in a human cell, we can't have that because that's when disease starts setting in. So, but things like metformin, lidocaine, which we, of course, think minor surgery. We also think going to the dentist, we used to call it Novocaine. Um, there's, of course, HIV drugs. There's uh, most of the NSAIDs, including also and beyond the NSAIDs, Tylenol, but naproxen, ibuprofen have all been shown to impact and lead so, to mitochondrial dysfunction. And if you look at the list of conditions that are associated with mitochondrial dys dysfunction, there's over 300 health conditions. And the ones we see, the fatigue, exercise intolerance, cardiac issues, can be blood pressure, because as I was sharing with our audience, just like the lining of our GI tract has to be properly fueled so we can digest, our pancreas has to have enough energy to make the enzymes, our brush borders and our villi and our small intestine were healing because we were doing gluten, now we're not doing gluten and we're trying to heal them. Well, of course, they need to have the energy to repair and maintain their wellness. And so it's interesting because the, the endothelia, the lining of our blood vessels, and also something called the glycocalyx, which is even beyond that in terms of protecting our, and help produce nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, we all know that in 1998, it got Nobel Prize because it's a gas our body makes, nitrogen and oxygen, which actually vasodilates expands our blood vessels. So think of a larger garden hose versus a neuro garden hose, provide more oxygenation and nutrients to the body. And but once again, if the endothelia, those little single cells that are lining our blood vessels aren't fueled, they're not going to do the nitric oxide and do their protection. And what I call remain the nonstick pan because the endothelia when healthy or much like cooking in a nonstick pan, it's, things aren't going to stick nearly as much. Same thing with the glycocalyx. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So um, when when we're thinking about this question, and this is a little bit um, of a segue, but um, I think it's relevant, how would we measure whether or not our mitochondria is functioning well or not? Is there any tools that you like to turn to, to just do a measurement or give us some clues as to how functional our overall mitochondria is? Yeah, well, probably my simplest tool and the broadest tool I use is a very simple organic acid test. I have a laboratory I enjoy using for that, but I want to know how well our citric acid Krebs cycle is working. I want to know that we're going from pyruvate down through acetyl-CoA to citrate to, once again, cisaconate to isocitrate, alpha-ketoglutarate to succinate onwards to, the, of course, the fumarate, oxaloacetate, you know, the little cycle that I have in my head. And because ultimately going down through succinyl CoA, we're going to make ATP. But anywhere along the way, if you're a nutrient insufficient, you're going to actually have what I call the beaver dam. You're going to have bioaccumulation of a substrate, and you're not going to go down that pathway. So you need oxygenation. You need to have your nutrients. And it's the same thing with the pyruvate to acetyl CoA. It's the same thing when we get fatty acids going through hydroxymethylglutarate or keto um, calparate, or likewise, the same thing over here with the, the keto isovalorate, all from my head. I'm not looking at anything, but these are all th ways that if we have an obstacle, so I like to always quantify it. And it's beautiful. It's a simple urine test. Yeah. Yeah. It's very uh, accessible too and practical, um, not, not terribly expensive. I, I enjoy using that in my practice as well. And there's just so much information you can glean from it. From it, so I'm glad that's your uh, your go to. Yeah, it's it's my go to because it's simple. The other thing which I like to do in a standard laboratory test 
is I like to measure pregnenolone. And of course, you and I know we go from cholesterol down to pregnenolone to make all our steroidal hormones. And from pregnenolone, we make either DHEA or we can go down to 17-hydroxyprogesterone or make progesterone that will go down into cortisol, cortisone. But likewise, through the DHEA path, we'll make anastenodione and then down to, of course, testosterone and estrogen in both men and women, just, of course, different ratios amongst the um, different amounts of X and Y chromosomes we may have. And so what's interesting is pregnenolone is made in the mitochondria. So cholesterol enters the mitochondria within the cell and actually it goes through a cytochrome pathway and it actually comes out pregnenolone. And if we're talking about a testicular cell or an ovarian cell, an adrenal cell, then that pregnenolone is then taken per the DNA, which of course requires the energy, that mitotricity to actually then allow that DNA to have the energy to do what it needs to do. And it converts that pregnenolone into the steroidal hormones. And what's interesting, as we get older in our adrenal glands, our testicular and ovarian cells start waxing and waning, there's a direct correlation that there's actually diminished mitochondrial health. So you need the hormones to support the mitochondria and the mitochondria to actually make the hormones. So once again, that catch-22 is so absolutely essential. And that's what we do, you and I and many of the listeners, we're functional medicine. We know that it all works in a beautiful harmony or dance. And you can't just treat one thing. You have to treat the foundation. And that's why I'm very much into treating the mitochondria. So there's an energetic capacity. But the blood test of pregnenolone, if that is low, will also kind of give us a little bit of a clue where the mitochondria is at in terms of its function. Wow, that is really interesting. Um, thank you for explaining that. How about Co CoQ10? Yeah, Co CoQ10 is definitely one of those things that we've been using for you know, two or three decades now. Um, I think CoQ10 is great. And if you're using a regular CoQ10, it's great for the extracellular component outside of the mitochondria. And that's important because, of course, we have the what we call the respiratory um, chain, electron transport chain. But to enter the cell, you actually have to have a unique delivery for the, mito, the CoQ10, and it's called MitoQ or mitoquinone. And what they've done, and one company in particular called MitoQ, is they actually went ahead and attached a triphenylphosphonium molecule. And you're saying a triphenylphosphonium molecule, why would you want to attach that to a CoQ10? Well, the concept is it brings a positive charge. And much like refrigerator magnets, we know the opposites attract. Well, the mitochondrial membrane is negatively charged. With the triphenylphosphonium molecule, it actually allows for the mitoquinone, known as mitoQ, so M-I-T-O-Q, and to actually cross over hundreds of times more. There's over 400, 350 to 400 peer-reviewed journal articles on its benefits. At about 20 milligrams a day is where a lot of the research is at. And I can actually provide you the bibliography if you want to share that with the um, listeners. And once again, no claims are being made here, but I educate on MitoQ. I also educate for a company called Truniagen, which we know that NAD levels also diminish with aging. And they also cause, once again, lower and lower energy. So NAD, MitoQ, as you point out, CoQ10, all but paramount importance. And as you and I both know, then individualizing this even further with like an organic acid oat test, important. And I'm an educator for US Biotech as well. And they even do an environmental pollutant panel with the OAT test. If you could com combine them for $199 is what our patients pay. And what's interesting is a measure for styrenes and parabens and phthalates and all those different toxins, which once again, weren't around 100 years ago, let alone 1,000 years ago or thousands of years ago, which once again, we in the, as a human race have pretty much created a cesspool of, can we survive? And my boys are 22 and 26. And as we know, boys are more likely to have autism outcomes or experiences. But when they were born, they, there's a one in 500 chance that they would have the experience of autism in their life. Now it's what, one in 48? And if we were any other species over a generation, we would be on a watch or endangered list if one in 48 bald eagles 
were non-thriving compared to one in 500 20 years ago, it would be like a watch list. So once again, lots of news that isn't being reported, and we need mm-hmm. to kind of realize, okay, well, how bad will bad get before we say, what the heck? And we know there's mitochondriopathy issues in part, along with methylation and microbiome, um, with individuals suffering from autism, Alzheimer's, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Okay. And just to clarify with the CoQ10 and NAD, those can be well measured as well in laboratory. Um, yeah, to a degree. There's, you know, of course, like cell um, companies like SpectraCell that can measure CoQ10 function. The intracellular mitochondrial um, CoQ10, I'm not real good measurement of it. You can only measure it indirectly as far as I'm aware. There was a study showing uh, what's called a crossover. They did six weeks of 20 milligrams of MitoQ, and then they crossed over and gave it to the previous placebo group. And they actually found that 20 milligrams increased like blood vessel dilation, which once again, watering the garden with a larger hose. So there's some Mm -hmm. direct measurements, but I'm not sure how to measure MitoQ other than from a functional clinical, how are our patients doing? And of course, protective layers. Right. Okay. Well, getting to some bigger picture things people could do to help their mitochondria thrive, you know, today without, you know, without even taking a pill or supplement, um, what, what are some things or lifestyle choices you've already outlined, you know, being scrupulous about medication choices and really understanding the long-term effects of certain medications? What about just lifestyle, nutrition, diet choices? Yeah, well, certainly. Well, obviously living a clean life as much as you can. And we started right before the show talking about how I just got done moving into a newer home and I can experience the off-gassing of some of the finishes in the house. And so what we want to do is make our environment as least toxic as possible. So I'm actually in the process of working on that. And as you said, Chris, you already know what to do. (laughs) And and it's it's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to get the VOC filters out. I'm going to do, of course, immune and mitochondrial support. So once again, every time you smell something, including driving along in your automobile, you're like, if you're smelling the exhaust, that's where you hit a threshold. It's already in the cabin of your vehicle. So always have your car and recirculate as you're driving. If it's smoky or um, polluted or it's a forest fire outside, don't breathe that because, of course, that's going to, once again, poison the mitochondria. Then, of course, the simple naturopathic things that we all encourage people to do, drinking clean, pristine water without fluoride, you know, filtering the fluoride out and making sure your fluoride iodine levels are good because if your thyroid is slow, you're actually going to have slower mitochondrial function. Once again, all things being equal. Interesting, there's thyroid receptors on the mitochondria. And a T3 hormone actually goes down to the mitochondria. And much like a, a metronome for like musical instrument, it determines how fast your mitochondria is going to work. And so once again, making sure your thyroid's dialed in and also drinking your water, detoxifying. I'd like to do quarterly cleanses for my patients. Um, sweating as well, and then, of course, showering after the sweating, and as well as two to three bowel movements a day. And my patients go like, what? Now, you're, you're losing me here, doc. And I'm saying, well, have you had children? Oh, yeah, I've had a child. Well, what happens? They eat, and they, as my father-in-law from Oklahoma, a farm boy would say, they make room. You, otherwise, if your bowels aren't moving, you're going to absorb toxic water. And you and I probably use the same Bristol stool chart in our practice, and audience isn't familiar with the Bristol stool chart, you'll see that ones and twos are much harder stools. Threes and fours are more middle of the road. And then five, sixes, and sevens get on the runnier side and mushier side. Well, what happens with a drier stool? You reabsorb that moisture, just like with the looser side, the sixes and sevens, it comes out and it's all wet and mushy and a mess. Well, that you lost that moisture, but you're, with that comes the muddy water. And so when we're poisoned, we get rid of toxins, food, poison, other ways with diarrhea. But if you have harder stool, drier stool, it's going to, of course, you're going to reabsorb that muddy water. And you're going to, no pun intended, since it's poop water, you're going to feel poopy. And so I tell my patients, bowels got to move, got to be drinking your three liters of water a day. 
we lose 500 milliliters, half a liter, just by breathing every day. And that's not even in a hot environment. Let's say if you're in Arizona or, or Texas, for example. So very good naturopathic things. And then avoid the dirty dozen foods, which you just Google dirty dozen foods for those that are not familiar. There's a chart of dirty dozen, 15 clean foods. And then, of course, try to eat as high as you can in terms of cleanliness and quality. Because would we ever put 99 cent gas in our car? We would like... Well, that's a pretty good deal. But he's like, but okay, what's going to be the damage to the engine if this is this has to, something has to be wrong with the ninety nine cent um, fuel? And but people will stop at a fast food restaurant, get the dollar a meal or ninety nine cent meal, and not even think twice about the damage occurring to their body. So just being really mindful. What do you like to use, Doc, to support the mitochondria? Well, I was thinking that you know the organ meats have been discussed a lot. Um, as a way to support mitochondrial function, whether it's you know, the one that I'm most common with is like eating liver. And I've heard, and maybe you can validate that, is that it's related to some of the CoQ10 levels um, that you're getting out of liver. Yeah, and I think um, definitely liver, of course, a clean liver, which of course in today's dirty world is a challenge, so obviously free range, organic, um, but of course, we know our liver, um, major cleansing organ. So people say, well, I'm just going to go to a store and get a USDA approved liver. It's like, yeah, no, probably not. But yeah, if you had eating clean, pristine liver, also um, meat, just regular um, free range meat also has a fair amount of CoQ10 in it. And of course, lots of phytonutrients because we also know things like resveratrol, um, also protective of the mitochondria. Because the mitochondria experience 90% of all the intra within the cell free radical damage. So it's like they are a car with a hose from the tailpipe to the engine compartment. They're breathing their own pollution. So antioxidants, fresh fruits and vegetables, absolutely critical. And then once again, knowing that we are only as healthy as our total cells. And when I gave a lecture in New York about a decade ago to docs, and these are mostly three or 400 medical doctors at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm an Oregonian all my life. And I said, boy, I'm a little tired to tell you this. But, you know, I've got 90 minutes in me. I have a 90 minute. I was a keynote speaker. But I says, let me ask a question. Because we're, we were going to talk about genetics that day. And I says, let's talk about, we're going to talk about genetics and epigenetics. And we're talking about research. But I'm going to ask you all a question. I'm tired and I've, I don't have very much hair for the audience. And so I, and I make, I always make the joke. Well, yeah, of course I had to wake up an hour early. So I was really up since three o'clock my time. Once again, I was in the East coast, it was seven o'clock East coast time. And I'm saying, but how many cells in my body have to be tired before I think I'm tired or perceive I'm tired. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I says, I don't know. And I really want, if any of you can tell me, cause I've looked it up. I've not seen anything. How many cells is it a, million cells? Is it a billion cells? Knowing that we're made of about 50 trillion cells, give or take. And no, no, no answer. I says, okay, well, let's go one step simpler. And I held up my index finger. I says, how many cells in my finger have to hurt before I perceive it? Mm -hmm. And once again, no answer because nobody knows how much, you know, as 2020 here, that was 2010 when I was doing the talk, but nobody knew. I says, mm -hmm. and this is why I want to ask this question, because when we talk about genetics, I'm going to tell you what we know from the medical literature, but realize whatever we know five years from now, we're like, oh my gosh, we didn't know that. And so it's just really a perspective to always stay humble about the human body and realizing what we call in naturopathic medicine, the V's meticatrix nutri, or as the Chinese medicine practitioner called the qi or the preheaven jing. It's once again, that thing which we don't know. So our goal as human beings, knowing that we can't trade in our bodies, like we can trade in our car, because we can be reckless with our car, not change the oil and not check the radiator fluid and or wrap it around a tree, hopefully not. But we can't do that with our bodies. So we have to tend to our bodies for a lifetime and ultimately make sure that we avoid as many potholes as possible, because otherwise we're going to start having some suspension issues at the very least. Mm -hmm. I see. So, yeah. And, you know, kind of to weave that back into the nutrition question. So it seems to me, you know, this emphasis on mining your, your mitochondria would be, you know, again, the in, um, inflammation reducing foods 
And then also I've heard um, an emphasis on healthy fats to help with like mitochondrial membrane. Is that something that you think of? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think with that question, whether it be our, our cells, the, you know, and that, it's not us and them, because after all, the mitochondria and our nuclear DNA are working as a take team, but making sure you have the choline, making sure you have the essential fatty acids, because, of course, our cells have the bilayer, of course, there's a large amount of fat and cholesterol, because we always vilify cholesterol. And of course, making sure that we have the antioxidant to prevent rancicity um, or our cells from going through lipid peroxidation. So this is where our fruits and vegetables, eating the rainbow, and once again, clean and pristine. But you know, big, I'm big on essential fatty acids, uh, threes and nines, but also we need a little bit of omega-6. And also another one which we often forget to talk about is omega-7, which is also a very potent anti-inflammatory. And one of the big challenges when we have mitochondrial issues and modern lifestyle is something called inflam aging, which I'm sure you've talked about before with the audience. And it just accelerates the aging process tremendously. It's actually believed to be more problematic than, of course, even cholesterol for the vast majority of people because it's causing that ravage and damage throughout the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for bringing that up. And, you know, I think the other really key cornerstone things to think about, which probably would be a podcast in itself, is the effect of exercise on help, helping your mitochondria and the importance of um, good sleep, as you've alluded to earlier. Um, but we're learning how much that's important in preserving brain function and the mitochondria that's related to brain function. So um, maybe that's a topic we can get into another time together. Um, so I wanted to honor your your time commitment, and we really appreciate you being on with us. If there's one or two take-home messages you could leave us with, that would be great. And then also if you could share some more information about you, your practice, how to follow your work, some of the, the things you're out there doing. Well, thank you. And first off, I have to thank you for doing this wonderful outreach to the public, to healthcare professionals. We all need just pass on the word and become smarter and better because we are the health care change we want to see where it's never going to be administered or legislated. It's us taking charge of our own health and that proverbial horse to the water. Um, myself, I've been a, a naturopathic physician for 28 years, former dean down here in Oregon of the Naturopathic University for seven years. And I just do a lot of writing. I do a lot of lecturing. And I just really enjoy what you and I both know because that's one of the principles of naturopathic medicine, do a which in Latin means one who teaches. And each of the people, whether healthcare providers or the general public, hearing this message can pass that message on. But I think the take home is eat well, be well, and realize we only got one time around when it, with this particular human body, and we have to take care of the mitochondria. And that includes regular CoQ10, MitoQ, which is a substance I take daily. And the way I give advice to my patients is what do I do for me or mine? And so I take Truniagen, a product which has the, it's called nicotinic riboside or nicotinamide riboside. It's the only one that has the clinical trials on it. And then I take the MitoQ, which has lots of clinical trials. And I found out when I was 30 years old, that I had sleep apnea. I was six foot one, 180 pounds, and I was going down to 65% oxygen. And the other thing is know what your DNA is because your DNA, um, if you have a methylation defect or other things, this will also will impact your mitochondria. And always know what your TSH is, which is a thyroid, T3, free T3 and reverse, because that also affects your mitochondria. But eating towards wellness and eating for a lifetime is I think the key in my opinion. Excellent. And what's the best way for people to continue to follow your work? Um, probably my website, um, drmelitis.com. And if you'd be so kind as to put a link on, um, so that's kind of probably the big one. Of course, I'm on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. So yeah, we'll put some link links up for the listeners. Well, this was excellent. I, um, learned a ton and I'm sure our listeners did as well. And so thank you for your valuable time and for sharing your expertise. Hey, well, thank you. It's an honor and keep up the great work. Okay. Thank you. And we'll be in touch. Take care. Okay. Thanks. 
Thank you so much for listening to the One Thing Podcast. I know there are a lot of different options out there for you to listen to. So I appreciate you being here with me today and with the rest of the listeners. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast player, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or any other player that you enjoy so that you get immediate announcements when we launch episodes. I'm also wanting you to share the episodes through your social media channels and with friends and loved ones. Let's really get this information out there. Finally, please consider going over to http backslash anchor.fm backslash adam hyphen rindy r-i-n-d-e and becoming a show sponsor it takes a lot of work to launch these episodes and i want to continue to be able to invest my time and resources in bringing you the best content your support will allow me to do this once again thanks again for tuning in